Well, Ms. Hello, welcome to another edition of Shaka Extra Time. I am Paul Mbiho. Uh, joining me on set is Shaka Sali himself, a.k.a. the Kabale Kid. Hello, Shaka. Hello, Paul. How are you? Well, I have to say that uh, I am simple, easy, and awesome. Very good, very good. Thank you. A warm welcome to all our Facebook followers are watching us live. Uh, Shark Extra Time is a show that comes to you every Tuesday. And today we are taking a look at uh, the death of long t Zimbabwe's long-time uh, leader, Robert Mugabe. Uh, Shaka, uh, people all over the world are still uh, mourning the death of uh, uh, Zimbabwe's uh, long-time uh, leader, Robert uh, Mugabe, uh, who passed away last week. And uh, as we speak, uh, they the body is yet to be uh, repatriated back to uh, Zimbabwe. Uh, your thoughts? Well, they have to mourn him, obviously, because he was a human being. And as a human being, uh, you have people looking at him through different lenses of their experience. It's like what they say sometimes about beauty. They say that, in fact, if you want to understand beauty very well, you should listen to those who say that uh, beauty is in the eyes of the beholder. So people like uh, Robert Gabriel Mugabe... I like Mugabe. your analogy. <laughs> people like Robert Gabriel Mugabe, he was a man uh, who obviously had supporters. He was a man who did great things at the beginning of his career, uh, when he became uh, the essentially independence uh, Zimbabwean leader, really, because, by the way, before he became the executive prime minister in 1980. There was a country called Rhodesia, which had uh, been under rebel prime minister Ian Smith. And earlier, that Rhodesia was part of a territory that was a personal, uh, really, uh, property yeah. of a man who the British called Sir John Seso Rhodes. That was the man who owned that particular territory. Zimbabwe became uh, uh, a country after independence uh, on uh, April 18, 1980, being led by uh, the Executive Prime Minister Robert Gabriel Mugabe. Arguably, one of the most educated individuals to hold that position, even though some people will tell you later that uh, in later years, that education didn't seem very much to reflect what was happening on the ground. Uh, Shaka, uh, going back uh, to the analogy you made earlier, uh, uh, looking at uh, Zimbabwe in the context of uh, beauty, uh, Mugabe, uh, like you rightly said, had a lot, a lot of uh, supporters. And uh, I was even surprised to see a lot of African presidents uh, admired that guy or revered that guy from uh, the kind of uh, condolences uh, messages they've been sending. Uh, it looks like uh, Mugabe was one of those uh, heroes that a lot of them uh, looked up to. But on the other hand, uh, Mugabe had a lot of uh, critics, especially the West uh, did not uh, like Mugabe uh, precisely because uh, maybe he gave back land uh, to a lot of Africans. Africans said that uh, it was because of that land that uh, a lot of Western countries decided to uh, part ways with him. You know, that land, uh, when you talk about land, uh, almost anywhere, it is a very emotive type of uh, situation. But in the particular case of Zimbabwe, really, when you think about it, uh, uh, land, the majority of the arable land for a very, very long time was in the hands of a minority white commercial farmers. And the indigenous Zimbabweans at the time uh, pretty much uh, lived, on the edge, lived on the edges, really. They mm -hmm. lived in the arid, arid type of land, or some, some land that is almost like semi-desert and all that kind of stuff, and obviously not very productive. 
And uh, when you read the history of uh, that territory and its surrounding areas, there is incontrovertible evidence, for example, that those people initially who took over that land did not, in fact, pay for it. They essentially conquered the territory by force of arms. Uh, they killed some of the uh, uh, individual, I mean, natives that they had found there, uh, appropriated the land that belonged to certain specific individuals and all that kind of stuff. And of course, uh, put in place a uh, illegal sort of regime, uh, which obviously became uh, uh, the law that protected them. Uh, having said that, uh, after so many, many, many years, you had uh, these uh, emerging African liberation movements. Mm -hmm. And Mugabe was one of those uh, key leaders uh, who eventually ended up uh, leading uh, what is now called ZANU-PF, uh, which obviously uh, gave a lot of uh, uh, hard time to the rebel uh, Prime Minister Ian Smith when he declared uh, back in uh, 19, early 60s, when he declared the Unilateral Declaration of Independence from the British, mm. uh, because he feared that uh, the British, uh, having given independence uh, to a lot of African countries, beginning with Ghana uh, in March uh, uh, 1957, mm. uh, the minority whites led by Ian Smith uh, feared that uh, this land would actually eventually uh, be controlled by the majority indigenous Africans. And so they seized the power. And the Africans decided that uh, they were definitely going to fight for their freedom. And eventually, when you end up at the Lancaster Independence uh, Conference in 1979, if I remember my, uh, uh, you know, my years correctly, yeah. uh, they came up with a constitution. And by the way, Paul, a written constitution in this particular case by a country Great Britain at the time, which has the distinction of in fact having a constitution that is not written down. Mm. The British have an unwritten constitution, but they end up in the business of making sure that uh, if you get independence from them when they were colonialists, they actually write a constitution for you. <laughs> and, and in that particular constitution, they actually left in what people or analysts call a sort of social, cultural, political time bomb. The land issue was not supposed to be really dealt with, at least for the first 10 years of political independence of what became Zimbabwe. That was really the problem that eventually uh, Mugabe had to deal with because he had played all the other cards that he had and to reach the point where he still needed to hang on to power. But in order for him to hang on to power, mm. he had to be able to have something, something that uh, he would provide for the Zimbabwean people in order for them to accept him to be their ruler or governor whatever you may want to choose. Mugabe started as a, a remarkably popular leader, especially because uh, he came up with perhaps one of the best educational policies on the African continent, Correct. and perhaps anywhere really for that matter. And uh, he also uh, came up with a very good policy of health care, and you name it. Uh, so he seemed to be really a man on the move. He seemed to be a man that uh, uh, really was there for the ordinary Zimbabwean. But towards the end, mm -hmm. uh, Paul, it became a different ball game because when he decided to deal with that land issue, he did not have support from his Western partners. And his Western partners decided to hit him left and right with sanctions and you name it. And hence, the beginning of the end, really, of Zimbabwe as, as the world had come to know it.
Uh, just a quick uh, follow-up. Uh, a lot of people talk about uh, the land issue as uh, a, a 2000, uh, 1999, 98, uh, 2000 issue. But this goes back to the Lancaster Agreement. Uh, one, of, one of the things that they signed at the time was the land, how land was going to be given back to uh, ordinary or uh, indigenous uh, Africans. No, they but, did not. Uh, yeah. They decided that uh, you were not to touch the land issue for the first 10 years. After 10 years, uh, essentially there were these uh, diplomatic you know, discussions and what have you and stuff like that. Uh, there was some kind of agreement between the government of Robert W. Mugabe and uh, the government of Britain. They decided that uh, they were going to provide some Funding. In fact, this was, by the way, largely supported by the United States under the Carter, Jimmy Carter administration. Mm. I was an undergraduate student uh, in upstate New York, and uh, I remember a man called Andrew Young. Andrew Young was uh, an African American who, at the time, was uh, uh, Andrew uh, Jimmy Carter's uh, uh, permanent representative to the United Nations. And he was the man, along with, uh, I believe it was, uh, it was, I think, John Owen. It was uh, the foreign secretary of uh, the British government. Mm. Uh, they were the ones that uh, negotiating, really, uh, how to w go around uh, in terms of uh, putting together a package mm. uh, that eventually would be used uh, to buy out some of these white farmers on what was considered to be a uh, willing, willing seller and willing buyer, you know, that kind of uh, uh, policy. And uh, unlike, for example, in Kenya, where that was executed under Jomo Kenyatta, uh, so that eventually, in fact, uh, the land that was owned to the settler community, the white settler community, uh, was passed on to the Kenyan elite not the ordinary people. In Zimbabwe, yes, the fund, in fact, was initially disbursed uh, under Margaret Thatcher, the Iron Lady. Mm. It, was conti it continued to be disbursed under Prime Minister John Major. But when Tony Blair came into office, then the policy changed significantly. That was the beginning, really, of the trouble. Uh, of the problems really in Zimbabwe. Uh, let's move on, Shaka. Let's uh, go to a quicker comment here from uh, Georgia Mulungana. Uh, Shaka, uh, if you had a choice uh, between uh, Mugabe, uh, who a lot of people have called their hero, and Mandela, who do you consider a hero? Well, to be honest with you, the issue of considering somebody a hero, again, is like the issue of love. It is in the eyes of the beholder. I like how you're using that analogy. <laughs> <laughs> it is in the eyes of the beholder. There are people clearly uh, who believe that uh, each of these particular individuals is a hero in his own way. Even though on balance, uh, most probably would agree that uh, Mandela, the Madiba, uh, is a hero. But there are those Probably. who say he's a sellout. He sold out. He never gave land uh, to black South Africans. Precisely. As a matter of fact, uh, there are people in South Africa and in Africa who say that uh, the people who consider Mandela uh, as a hero are the people that uh, held land, held property, and never lost it. And those that uh, had nothing, uh, for some reason, they look at him through different lenses, really. But let's face it, uh, you have a man here who spent 27 and a half years as a prisoner on Robin Island and other places because he was fighting for freedom, and not only the freedom for Nelson Mandela, but the freedom, in fact, for people who looked like him in South Africa. But you could make the same argument about uh, Mugabe. He was also incarcerated for at least 10 years. Uh, uh, he was fighting for the same freedom that you're talking about. Yes, yes. But again, you see, Mandela uh, 
he did practice what you would call a reconciliation. And not only that, he was not politically a greedy leader. Mandela was so popular, Paul, in South Africa, to the extent that, in fact, even if he had died uh, in office or died, his body, South Africans probably, most South Africans probably, mm. would even vote for his body mm. to be the president of South Africa. Now, given the kind of popularity that this man commanded, this man, after the first term of office, five years, the man decided to retire mm. and hand over power to the man who had been uh, number two man. Uh, he anointed him, Tabombeki. Even though, by the way, uh, reports at the time suggested that uh, he actually uh, was leaning largely towards a guy called Cyril Ramaphosa. Mm. But Cyril Ramaphosa, having never lived in exile, having stayed in South Africa uh, and did his thing really as a lawyer through the trade union and all that kind of stuff and through negotiations, uh, the ANC, which was largely controlled by the elements who had actually been in exile, uh, they did not feel comfortable with that, and they went with Tabombeki. Uh, so, let's stay in South Africa. Let's go to uh, what a lot of uh, people have characterized as, uh, uh, as something that uh, shouldn't be happening uh, in South Africa, uh, the xenophobia attacks. Uh, uh, let's start uh, with uh, Stanley uh, Congo, Congo, Congo Moon. Uh, what causes xenophobia in South Africa? I think there are so many factors, uh, Paul, but uh, one of them is that uh, you are talking about uh, a people, the indigenous South African uh, blacks, uh, were denied, for example, education. They had a different type of education, uh, which is largely different from what uh, you and I know. They had what they called Bantu education. And this was government policy, apartheid government policy. They were never supposed to acquire modern skills so that they could actually live a very productive life. They were basically supposed to occupy the role of being a slave, really, being a servant, perpetually, a servant of the white man. Uh, they obviously, as a result of the manner in which they were treated, they lost confidence in themselves. They became very insecure, you know, let's face it. And by the time they got independence in South Africa, 1994, they did not have the skills to run a modern nation state, except to those South African blacks who had actually been living in exile. They are the ones, ironically, who acquired the higher education and acquired some skill sets and all that kind of stuff. But the majority, the vast majority of the South African black people within South Africa, they did not. And therefore, when you look at the policies of apartheid, you look at the centuries of white settler type of colonialism mm -hmm. that, in fact, was distinct, for example, from the type of colonialism that uh, uh, you people experienced in a country like Uganda, in a country like Ghana, a country like Nigeria. These people were traumatized through that type of experience that lasted for many, many, many decades. But how about the people who argue that uh, uh, these Africans that, that are being attacked uh, in a way contributed immensely to the kind of uh, uh, prosperity that we see in South Africa? Uh, a lot of uh, South Africans had to leave that country to go elsewhere, really, to where they were accommodated or in ta uh, some were refugees in all these other African countries. And the same people uh, who are attacking these people, were some of them were direct beneficiaries of those people who are seeking refugees in other countries. Yes, but I think that uh, you are looking really at uh, a different time period here. Uh, Xenophobia really comes up after 
what you would call the liberation of South Africa, the all race type of democracy, which was championed by Nelson Mandela, the Madiba, after 1994. Those who were in South Africa before, coming from different African countries and what have you, we are not working in the type of South Africa that we are looking at right now. They were working in a South Africa that uh, was part of what was called Bantustans. The Bantustans that were never recognized, by the way, by the international community, not the United Nations. Not even the United States, in fact, recognized the Bantustan, even though under the Reagan administration, uh, in some sense, one could say the U.S. sort of supported apartheid because it adopted uh, a policy of construct, constructive engagement. Constructive engagement and for the most part, uh, really used to, uh, in a sense, uh, uh, be pretty much perceived to be on the side of the white minority rule. I mean, yeah. to the extent that uh, I remember there was um, a Senator McGovern a Democratic Party, uh, you know, senator, who one time visited South Africa and he had to fill forms. And when he was filling forms, there was a category which asked you to list your race. And he actually filled the form as human race. Mm. <laughs> Very interesting. Uh, le le let's go to some... Uh, uh, Nayala James, he says, how can we bring together uh, Africans as a family, especially in light of what we're talking about, uh, xenophobia attacks in uh, South Africa? I think we need to, first of all, uh, think very, very seriously about how to embrace what I would call social, economic, political justice for all of us. And that can only come about if we embrace uh, what really is uh, uh, something that uh, is pretty much uh, a deficit on the African continent, which mm. is democracy. We need to have a democracy, uh, a democracy that results, for example, in an election, not a selection, managed by an individual who happened to have advantages, but actually an election that is conducted by an independent electoral commission, which at the end of the day uh, announces results that in fact reflect the will of the voter, the will of the people, not the will of the individuals who are counting the vote, not the will of the individual who announces the election results, like we have seen in many, many African countries. But that is not to say that there are no democratic countries or emerging democratic countries on the African continent. There are some, but there are few, still very, very few. Shaka, there is a quick follow-up here. Uh, what, is, what does xenophobic attacks, uh, Africans, uh, South African, black Africans are killing Africans, uh, got to do with uh, elections and uh, having democratic governance? Of course, it has, it has everything to do with social, economic, political injustice. First of all, you have these legi legitimate uh, South African indigenous black people who, I say, when you look in history, they were denied the right type of education. They were denied the opportunity to acquire modern skills that they would employ in a modern nation state type of economy. Mm. And they see people who look like them, who come from, for example, north of Limpopo, coming as engineers, mm. coming as doctors, coming as business people, coming with the skills that they were denied for a very long time, and therefore taking the type of jobs which they feel belongs to them. And so, to be honest with you, it's, I think, an issue of humanity. These are people who, in a sense, have been raised up in circumstances 
that have essentially made them feel very insecure. They have such a very uh, sort of insecurity type of complex. Mm. Uh, and frankly, there is no any other way you can explain it except that when they look at people who look like them, who dress better like them, who live in better neighborhoods, who have better jobs, better professions, and what have you, the only reason they think that those people have is because those people had advantages over them. Mm -hmm. And they don't have much really they can do about it. And therefore, they are basically getting into the business of scapegoating, you know, other people uh, at the expense of the weaknesses that they are suffering from. And therefore, the governments actually of South Africa should really step in and sort of come up with a sort of martial plan, especially for the younger South Africans. Make sure that education, for example, uh, is available to every young South African, so that at the end of the day, the young South Africans can look forward to acquiring a quality type of education that assures them to get the kind of modern skills that they really need. But South is that African going to change the mindset? Well. It may not change immediately, but at least it will give a sense of hope so that people can now know that they are basically in a position where they can benefit out of the opportunities that have been created. Because let's face it, unless you do something about it, South Africa is going to be a basket case. For example, there was recently the edition of uh, the World Economic Forum. And from what I have read, it looks like uh, it wasn't really as well embraced as it should have, especially because of the circumstances uh, evolving around xenophobia activities and what have you. Mm. You have but a situation where, for example, the president of Nigeria, Major General Muhammadu Buhari, a man who obviously is the president of a very, very important African country, and in fact a very important country in the world. For one reason, it is the single largest, it, it has the distinction of having been the single largest economy in Africa. In terms of population, it has more people than any other country in, you know, in Africa. And when you think about even Africans, really, in the diaspora, there are some statistics that suggest that one out of every four Africans may in fact be a Nigerian. Nigerians have become victims of xenophobia. And Nigerian, the Nigerian government has decided to evacuate those Nigerians who feel that they actually need to leave South Africa. And a company has also offered a plane, and as we talk, they are in fact evacuating Nigerians from South Africa. And back in Nigeria, there is also what you would call retaliatory attacks mm. by Nigerians against South African companies like, uh, like uh, MTN and what have you. Yeah, Shaka, we've run out of time. Unfortunately, I look forward to hosting you on another edition. Uh, thank you so much uh, to you all uh, from uh, Washington. Uh, this has been a great uh, show. We look forward to hosting you on another edition uh, next week.